relationship between these two areas. Um, and I wanted to interrogate this a little bit further because contemporaneous to the establishment that Bakime and the ascendancies of what we call the late medio period or what we might think of as a religious system is the Salado religious system, religious movement or meta identity if you work in Arizona, um, expanding really southward from East Central Arizona from the Safford Basin downward, um, resulting in sites here in far Southeastern Arizona um, having different names, whether it's animus phase or, or Salado period, um, not really being factored into what's going on here. And so I took a much more systematic approach. And the other thing I wanted to address um, as part of this talk a little bit, but also my work was, um, although this of course is very outdated, this map here and has um, other issues with it, I want to have researchers more, more critically interrogate these ideas of these distinctive ceramic distributions, Cadetas, Rodrigos, Ramos, Ramos, Via Humada, Babicara, and the Via Humada will be talked about by Tim Maxwell and Rafael Cruz and Dion. Um, to better understand why we have these distributions instead of just saying that they're they're individually distinctive, such as the southern region is very distinctive from the northern for very clear reasons. Um, but I'm focusing on the northern. And the predominant characteristic of this, of this region is not how we oftentimes think of it, which is a east-west running international border, which does have significant impact, but is a predominantly north-south running series of mountain chains with wide interspersed valleys. This is called Sky Island topography or island archipelago, um, where the, along the elevational gradient, um, we have a variety of different resources that you only get access to at different elevations at particular mountain ranges, resulting in isolated um, refugia populations in some cases. Um, this also means that uh, human populations in the past, prior to modern forms of transportation, really had only access from one um, wide basin into another through very limited access points, Apache Pass and things like that, very famously here in the, in the Chiricahua's Dos Cabezas mountain ranges. Um, and in these large basins, which are large grasslands, are sometimes a river, the San Pedro, and sometimes just um, ephemeral playas that are seasonally infilled, providing a variety of waterfowl, um, and some maize agriculture that you could do, but overall they're very high elevation and arid at about um, 5,000 feet above sea level, or about 1.6 about 1 kilometers. And excavations in this area, um, although there were early surveys in the 1920s and 1930s, really started the history of the understanding of this northern Casas Grandes region, started with um, the Cosgroves and Alfred V. Kidder's excavations, the Peabody excavations at Pendleton Ruin um, near Cloverdale, New Mexico in, 19, in October 1933. Um, Kidder, who wrote up the report 16 years later after the war, um, they, he was in the middle of working in Mesoamerica and elsewhere um, and was convinced to come back and write it up. Um, he was sick, so he didn't actually excavate it. The Cosgroves did. Um, and they wrote up a report and they detailed that they, they excavated there because they thought there was a strong relationship based on pottery. And they found that there really, there didn't seem to be a very strong Casas Grandes tie to Paquime um, at Pendleton Ruin. And that was sort of the predominant interpretation for, a, for about 30 years until excavations at the Joyce Well site, which is also in southwestern New Mexico, um, by an outfit here in, the, in Santa Fe, the School of American Research. It's now called the School of Advanced Research. Um, they excavated a site there, uh, 45 rooms or so, and I'll talk a little bit about that site, and encountered a sizable um, proportion of, of Ramos polychrome, um, leading them to really believe that it was a, a strong, um, well-integrated tied in community. The problem was they didn't actually finalize a report. Gene McClooney didn't finalize a report for the site. Instead, it languished in a manuscript form for nearly 40 years until this book came out. Um, and the details in this book regarding the site, outside of those um, done by James Skibbo and, and Bill Walker, um, where they excavated in the ball court, um, are from 1963 nearly verbatim with only minor changes. Um, so they're 40 years out of date. And so these ideas have led to two general characterizations. And here's where Joyce Well is, um, Boss Ranch, which I'm going to mention briefly, is right around here. And then there's 76 Draw, which I'm not going to talk about that's been more recently investigated. And here is the relationship to Pakime. I think all of us would agree that we should pull this in, this region of Casas Grandes, certainly to here, or at least uh, those of us who are more familiar with the eastern region would agree. But the northern region, right up here, along the international four corners, um, has had two general characteriz characterizations for how it's related. 
And the first is that it's nebulous, disconnected, and variable. That is that archaeological sites in this area dating to the same period as Pakime, presumably the same as Pakime. We don't have a lot of good dates for these sites yet. I'll talk about that. Um, are independent. They have very little to do with it. And it's just maybe an occasional exchange of Ramos polychrome that appears. Um, and the idea is that these are local agents with few obvious connections. Now, the alternative, the flip side of this in a lot of ways, and this is a continuum, it's not necessarily very clearly distinguished in some ways, but they, they kind of fit this way, is that it's that these sites, these northern sites, particularly Joyce Well, um, which was the one that has the best report at the time, um, are highly integrated into Pakime. Those who excavated 76 draw, um, for instance, often discussed uh, direct pilgrimage to Pakime. That's what they argue occurred, resulting in the creation or strong development of the site. Um, some of us would very much push back on that, but that's the author's interpretation. And they view them as having relatively few local agents, um, individuals, aggrandizers, elites, and instead um, seeing um, non-local, um, seeing non-local elites at Pakime setting up these ties to the north for either the growing of maize that's been proposed, that maize was grown here and, and transported down to fuel the population growing. That doesn't make a lot of sense from what we know. That obsidian, it's right next to an obsidian source, antelope wells, um, ant that would then be exchanged to Pakime. There is some obsidian from antelope wells um, at sites here. Um, however, it's much lower than one would anticipate or possibly turquoise. There's a turquoise mine up here called Hachita, um, but there's really limited turquoise both at animus face sites, almost none, and also extremely limited outside of Pakime and even within Pakime compared to broader ancestral Pueblo and other Southwest Northwest um, archeological sites. And so they usually rely on a combination of economic, as I discussed, socio-political, that these are elite um, established provinces effectively, or religious composition that they share a shared ri ritual system um, as evidenced by the bulk work network. And of course, these sites look nothing like where you actually are, and I wish I was there, um, Pakime. They are constructed of adobe for the most part, but they're relatively small with almost no evidence of multi-storied architecture or the masonry architecture that is found on the western side of Pakime, and almost no mounding. So I did for my dissertation two different studies and I combined them for these sites. The first was an architecture and mortuary study. So I looked at um, architectural and mortuary data from all these sites. Um, those that had it, mostly mortuary were here. Um, these are mostly survey data. Um, so I only had some architectural and I wanted to look at what the variety was and how they compare to sites near Casas Grandes that we know much more about. Um, and also how they compare within each other. So are these sites up here, which we usually think of as Salado, um, more directly related to sites down here that would make sense if it's just a natural decrease increase or vice versa, are these more Casas Grandes related? And what I noted, here's the excavation map of the Boss Ranch site. Um, it's a series of small little compounds and detached rooms that were occupied between the late 1100s, to the early 1300s or mid 1300s and they tended to be occupied along this um, sort of uh, north to southeastern um, expansion outward, with these being terminated. Um, this was the only map we know about. This is another site. This is one of the ones I worked at. It was excavated in the, or looked at, it was excavated in the 1960s and 70s, um, one of them as part of a project. And as you can see, it has a very different arrangement in some ways. It's a linear series of room block. It's a linear room block right here with a compound wall enclosing a plaza. And there's a variety of these. Um, if you looked elsewhere in the Southwest, not in Northern Mexico necessarily in Chihuahua, but if you looked in um, say in the Members Valley or elsewhere, you would say this dates pretty clearly to the late 1100s, 1200s, um, probably based on architecture. Um, I have some radiocarbon dates to support um, that it dates to the 1200s. But confounding that those are in southeastern Arizona is directly nearby are sites such as this, which are these large aggregated or relatively large, they're not on the scale of several hundred rooms, but up to 100 rooms, probably housing a population of 200 or so individuals at one time at, at most, probably much smaller than that, um, are, these, are these aggregated room blocks with enclosed plazas. Um, very unlike Paquime Casas Grandes, very much in some ways like Salado, um, as you find further north, but not directly adjacent, where you typically find a series of isolated room blocks that have a variety of forms. And of course, if you look, those are in southeastern Arizona. If you go into southwestern New Mexico, the two 
other most famous sites besides Joyce Well that were excavated, these were excavated in 1962, are Clanton Draw, which is two um, isolated small um, room block compounds located on top of mounds. Um, one here, and then there's one off to the side, Mount A. And then this is the Box Canyon site, which some have said have up to 350 rooms. Other survey maps strongly do not support that to be the case. Um, these are uh, far smaller, as you can see, and also they, they oriented very differently. In Semi-enclosed plazas with kind of U-shaped room blocks that just expand outward. And this is the type of form we find at Joyce Well. But the big question for these is what do they date to? And so you already see a difference in the architectural patterns between predominantly southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico, probably dating to the 1200s. These sites, I can tell you, do date to the 1200s. Um, and that's one problem we have is time. The other problem we have is sequence. These are excavation photos from Pendleton Ruin, the site um, that the Cosgroves excavated in October 1933. Um, and the report from Kidder's excavations only discuss about half of what they excavated, one of two mounds. And in that, they note, though, that there are multiple floors. And the ceramics from Pendleton do strongly attest that there is an underlying pit house component of some size, um, some indeterminate size, under the floor. Um, this is something that we really haven't thought of before for these large anonymous space villages, which is um, are these late pre-Hispanic villages um, built much like Pakime atop um, an existing earlier population, or are they newfound populations that have moved into a vacant corridor? Um, that's sort of the model that people who have proposed that it's a periphery have advocated for. Now, this is Joyce Well. This is the site that is probably provides the most robust evidence for strong relationships to Casas Grandes. Um, and part of it is architectural. Um, it has T-doors. As you can see partially in this photo here, it's one of the few that we know definitively have T-doors, the only one we definitively know. There are others we can strongly suspect. It has a um, collared post hole. Um, this has often been suggested to be Casas Grandes, but it's found at many other sites. It's not a very reliable attribute, but this is collared hearths or not, but platform hearths with scalloping is very Casas Grandes. And these are all found in alignment in room 18 right here. And there's a variety of them. There's another one in room 19, another room 23. Um, there's a series of these right here. And Joyce Well looks to be this size, but it actually expands. It continues this way, and then continues this way, and then continues this way. It's a series of U shapes that connect with open plazas in the center, um, possibly several hundred rooms, probably the second to third largest site in the International Four Corners in the late pre Hispanic period. Um, the other two, probably being Culberson and Timber Lake ruins also in far southwestern New Mexico, and they also have um, I-shaped ball court, or not I-shaped, but ball courts up here. There's a Casas Grandes ball court up here. I'll show you what it looks like. It's nothing near like you find at Paquime or elsewhere. Um, it's uh, pretty, well, they call it the bush leaks for a reason. Um, they also have those in large quantities of Ramos Palico. And so here is what these look like. They're just linear alignments of stones as you can see right here, um, in a semi-cleared space. The orientation of these is somewhat off. There's a series of, um, compared to the rest of Casas Grandes ball courts by about six degrees. Um, we do know, they're closer to some of those in Sonora. We do know that um, there's at least three, possibly four of these. Um, there's, a, there's additional ones mentioned, such as this one, which would be the, the furthest westward one in a photo. Um, however, this ball court or potential ball court is referenced to be at multiple different sites simultaneously. And so um, and crews have surveyed over this location and not identified it. It would need to be tested. So some of them have ball courts as integrated features. And, um, but only those in far southwestern New Mexico and only a few sites. Other forms of integrative architecture that have been suggested include a pl possible platform mound at Pendleton Ruin and a possible Great Kiva um, at the Ringo site, although that remains heavily debated. So here's what I'm talking about. This is the T-door or one of them sealed and then this scalloped hearth, which we know exists at at least two sites as far as we can tell. Um, and the results of that study, that summary of the architectural layout, architecture and mortuary patterns is available in this article in Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. If you can't get a copy of it, email me at this email down here and I'd be happy to provide it to you. Um, what it basically demonstrates is that there's a significant variety, both over time and simultaneously in an international four corners area, attesting to that there's not any great 
um, connection between all of the sites in the area and Pakimecas Grandes, but there are a series of definitively three sites, Culberson, Timberlake, and Joycewell, that stand out as very Casas Grandes um, related. Now here's radiocarbon dating. This hasn't been published yet. These are all the prior radiocarbon dates that I could find from this from the International Four Corners area. And you will find in some of them, the context is poorly known, such as the surface. Um, some of these I was able to reconstruct, such as those from Joyce Well that were done by um, G. McClooney in 1963. Um, I was able to find out exactly where they came from. And some of these are from Tita Brannis' work at Ojo de Agua. And they're not very good um, dates in terms of um, large distributions or other means. Um, here are the new dates. Here's what I procured as part of my dissertation. And these include combined dates from um, the same context within certain sites. Um, so they're highly precise. Here's a close up of what they look like. Um, unfortunately, some of the southeastern Arizona sites only have wood. The rest of these are predominantly on maize. And what they show are, are four key patterns. First, there's almost no post-1400 occupation. Anonymous face sites do not represent a refugia population of individuals migrating there after the termination of Pakime. Second, there's very um, there's some 1200 to 1300 occupation, predominantly in southeastern Arizona and late southwestern New Mexico. These are probably burn dates at, um, at, at uh, these two sites right here. Um, but most of the occupation is clearly the 1300s and clearly the middle 1300s. Um, I can, based on ceramics, cut off most of these later dates pretty easily, later distributions pretty easily. Um, there's also histories of uh, reoccupation and closure within sites. All the largest sites have, including Joycewell, have histories of occupation and closure within the, across those U-shape or across room blocks, meaning that our momentous population is far smaller than we initially think. Even though I may say Joycewell has possibly 300 rooms, um, we don't have a lot of evidence for the Eastern rooms. Um, they've been partially destroyed. But what we can tell from the Western rooms is at no given point were all of the rooms occupied contemporaneously. And it's possible the population was instead of several, um, several hundred, it was probably one to 200 individuals at any given time. And that the animus phase proper, this period of strongest connection to Casas Grandes, certainly post-dates 1380 or at least 1280 when these burn. Now ceramics, I also did a ceramic study. Um, I am very much hampered by the fact that I did not use comparable samples from excavated contexts from um, Sonora or Chihuahua. I used those from legacy projects that had been never reported or needed significant revision, such as Pendleton Ruin, um, because they'd never fully analyzed the ceramics from the site. In all, I analyzed approximately 80,000 ceramic shirts um, from these sites total. Um, and these are generally oriented west, so southeastern Arizona to east, northeast, uh, um, southwestern New Mexico. I know it sounds a little backwards. So just think um, so, um, sites just north of Sonora, sites just north of Chihuahua. And what you can see is this is just generic painted plain red slip percentages. Um, they're fairly comparable if they date the same, such as jo um, Jay Cowan and Joyce Well date the same. Culberson Run is a surface collection and is very biased um, towards painted. This should be much lower probably around here. It's probably identical to Joyce Well. And you know, some of the earlier sites such as Reagan and San Bernardino have much higher red slip percentages. Um, Clayton Draw also dates earlier. Um, but what was interesting when I investigated these is um, I had a variety of ceramic types. When you work in this area of the Southwest Northwest, um, you're, well, you're able to find 40 to 80 ceramic types very easily. Um, these are, and that's partially due to a variety of local production and large exchange networks. Um, so we had a variety of Salado polychromes, including late Salado types that date to the 1380s, 1390s at some of these sites um, in very limited proportions. And pretty much every single type of Casas Grandes or medio period Casas Grandes polychrome, we had Ramos, Babicaro, Rodrigos, Caretas, Dublon. Um, yeah, we had them all. Um, everything but Mata um, and Viajumata, of course, and all of these other ones. We also had quite a bit of El Paso polychrome, surprisingly, and then quite a bit of Babu Kumari and Santa Cruz polychrome, something that's a southeastern Arizona type that's, those are pretty poorly understood. Um, and then a variety of early red and brown types from the Safford, um, probably the Safford and San Simon areas, particularly at sites with underlying pit house components. There were very few, surprisingly so, northeastern Zenora types. Um, and I was a little surprised at the paucity of these, including in, in one sites directly on the border between Arizona and Sonora. 
Um, we had Zuni and White Mountain Redware series types that date to the late 1200s, early 1300s, and a few Rio Grande glazewares that were being imported from this, probably the middle or southern middle Rio Grande Valley um, or on Socorro, New Mexico. Here's what the painted ceramics look like by where, again, um, think of sites just north of Sonora to sites just north of Chihuahua. And Solano predominates in at most of these later dating sites in Arizona. And of course, correspondingly, Casas Grandes predominates at sites in New Mexico. However, they have an increased percentage of El Paso polychrome being imported. And these are representing a variety of other types. Um, these two sites, Reagan and Watson Windmill, which are both in Arizona, um, may represent um, enclaves from the Santa Cruz Valley or from the San Pedro Valley of Arizona um, because they have high, very high percentages of Santa Cruz polychrome. Um, no other site had anywhere near them. Um, but again, we had a variety of ceramic types attesting to these being in a lot of ways contemporaneous, especially the radiocarbon dates. Most of these sites are contemporaneous. These two are not, um, these two, these two are, um, and these two are not. But I didn't want to just look at the, uh, the painted ware because the painted ware is imported in a lot of ways, potentially locally made. Um, I'm awaiting results for neutron activation analysis to identify if possibly Casas Grandes um, pottery was made north of the, the contemporary US-Mexico border. I think we have some good evidence for it as in a very limited case. Um, but in any case, here is what the what we call the red slipped, even though Cloverdale corrugated is not always red slipped, it's red washed two red slip. This is a version that is actually with a slip that obfuscates the um, smeared indented corrugation. That's not a triangular gouged wear. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's plain, when it doesn't have a red slip. Um, this is the predominant type that's found over in Arizona versus those in, in New Mexico. And Cloverdale has long been thought to be an emulate of Plyus red made by local people, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Sites with strong Casas Grandes connections had predominantly Plyus red in comparison to Cloverdale and then vice versa. It probably actually relates um, more so, I would suggest, to populations in Northeastern Sonora, um, possibly uh, northward expansion of Opata populations across the border or exchanging um, ideas or practices just based on how this pottery is produced. It's not a Salado ware or it's not a Northern Mogollon ware in my mind that some have suggested. I think it, it has its, its roots in technology or at least in, in, um, yeah, in technology in Opata. So a brief summary and conclusions of this um, for you. Um, First, my research resets the classifications of Salado and Casas Grandes for sites in the International Four Corners area. Previously, that we used to define based on what I call frontier logic. The What you see on the surface, the most commonly decorated ceramic type is, is, is thought to be, oh, that's its cultural affiliation, that's its identity, and that doesn't seem to fit. And instead, we have to factor in architecture, mortuary practices, radiocarbon dating, um, sometimes lithics, but not really, and what the, what the planeware say, even more importantly, not just the decorated. Um, it provides a new localized understanding of transformation over this interval. Um, I did not have many sites that date to the 1150s, but we, we have a general idea what happened starting 1200 or so on, on very small scale habitation sites um, that are then aggregated into these larger communities. Although, again, the three largest sites in the area, Culberson, Timberlake, and, and um, Joycewell, have very limited evidence for directly antecedent populations living directly there. It provides a new way to change insights into the, the northern periphery, um, what, we, what we think of as the northern periphery, as well as Casas Grandes regional relations for, the, for what's thought to be the most highly integrated external zone. If this zone is not so extensively integrated into the Casas Grandes regional system, as some have proposed, um, outside of three sites, that really changes how we perhaps have to view connections to the south, to the east, and to the west. There's a significantly divergent and more engaged sites across multiple medium and performance-based media. Um, and by performance-based, I'm talking about those ball court features, I'm talking about the platform mounds, um, and other things like that. Um, from other peripheries, yet again, these are very patchy. We only find these at some sites. Now, why such relationships emerge? This is the big question, I guess, that I, that I was going to somewhat answer, I guess, with my, with my dissertation I didn't really get into is, um, why, did, why did we have these strong connections to the north at a few sites? Are these local or non-local elites? 
um, or their other rational. Again, I do not agree with the idea of turquoise being the source of it. I do not agree with maize being grown and exported necessarily, and I do not agree with obsidian um, being the extensive reason for this interaction. Um, instead, I believe there's two factors that we should think of. Um, one, there are sizable populations that are pooling in these areas compared to earlier, um, starting in the late 1200s into the 1300s. And these populations represent a variety of different ethnic groups engaging with different um, religious systems and populations. Um, and from these, some lineages probably become more um, powerful than others. Now, why we get some sites with more Casas Grandes relations and why there's particularly three sites and they all post-date 1280, 1300, as far as I can tell, um, when they expand very rapidly. Um, if I had to throw out a guess, I would say it has something to do with the fact that in the late 1200s, early 1300s, Pakime reaches its ascendancy over every other competing um, entity in the middle Casagrandes Valley. And something that happens very widely ethnographically when this happens is individuals from lesser or outcompeted, if you would, um, sites leave, local elites leave sometimes to establish other um, prestige bases, power bases. And that might have been the case that some individuals from the middle class around this valley relocated to those three sites in particular and established themselves or what, what ended up being very short-lived occupations can, Comparably, there's no evidence that these sites continued into the 1400s in a lot of ways. Um, and again, this has major implications for Pakime and other local studies. So instead of viewing the entirety of what's going on in the northern periphery as being due to Pakime's ascendancy and expansion, instead we have to look at more local connections and also factor in things such as Sonora, Opata, um, um, southeastern Arizona, um, what's happening along the San Pedro, and of course, Salado and others. And so for that, I'd like to um, thank a variety of institutional research partners who collaborated with me with my dissertation. Particularly, I'd like to thank the Central Ina Sonora and Jupiter Martinez Ramirez, who collaborated with me on the NAA. I will have those data to you shortly, and a variety of funding agencies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, it seems to me that we have no questions, so that will be it. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.